Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Hi everyone and thanks for your patience. We are ready to get started. On behalf of AgriLink's Feed the Future and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, or RFS, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on post-harvest strategies to increase resilience. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am your AgriLinks webinar host with the USAID RFS Bureau. And I'll be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. Before we dive into the content, I would just like to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, as many of you have done already. And also use the chat box to ask questions at any time and share your resources. We love our webinars to be as interactive as possible. And uh, also, one exciting piece of news is that this webinar marks our all-time record in registrations with over 1,000 people registering, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think it shows that post-harvest loss is a really important topic, and also that our audience has uh, caught on to the fact that if you register, even if you can't attend, you'll get the post-event email uh, with the uh, recording of the webinar and um, with uh, additional post-event resources. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar today, and we'll, we'll be uh, asking them at a Q&A session after the presentation. We'll also try and answer some in the chat box along the way. You'll see that the slides are available to download in the uh, file downloads box on your screen, and we also have a few recommended links there. And uh, lastly, as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded, and we will email you the recording uh, transcript and additional resources once they're ready. And they will also be posted on AgriLix. All right, I'm going to go over the agenda and then introduce our speakers, and we can dive into the content. So the agenda for the webinar today, we will start off with an introduction from Ahmed Kablan on the importance of reducing post-harvest loss to nutrition and food safety. Then Dr. Jagger Harvey will cover creating resilient communities through reduced post-harvest loss. We'll have Dr. George Opit speaking on using post-harvest loss mitigation technologies to build resilience in poultry farms in Dorma, Ghana. And then Dr. Georgina Bingham on improving livelihoods of smallholder farmer communities with innovative post-harvest storage and a grade trading platform. And then we'll head into our Q&A. So allow me just to introduce our speakers, and then we'll roll into the content. Uh, so Dr. Ahmed Kablan is Senior Science and Research Advisor for the Food Safety Division in the Center for Nutrition with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. And he is the Program Manager for the Feed the Future Soybean Innovation Lab, the Innovation Lab for re uh, Reduction of Post-Harvest Loss, and the uh, Nutrition Innovation Lab. And Jagger Harvey serves as the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for the Reduction of Post-Harvest Loss at Kansas State University. And at this lab, he is working with the team to ensure that their work is effectively translated into information, in, uh, interventions, and capacity to address post-harvest loss issues, specifically in Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Ghana, Guatemala, Honduras, Nepal, and beyond. And Georgina Bingham is Senior Technical Specialist in uh, for Global Partnerships and Food Security uh, at Best Regard. And within this role, she has brought two new food security products under the Zero Fly brand from development to launch. And last but not least, George Opit is a professor of stored product and post-harvest pest management in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at Oklahoma State University. And he is also the team leader for the Seed the Future Innovation Lab for the reduction of post-harvest loss. So I would like to pass the microphone over to Ahmed Kablan to give our introduction. Ahmed? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you, Yuri, for introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for um, this webinar. It is, uh, it is such an important topic to think when thinking about, especially in the current situation. Uh, and uh, right now, when we are looking at how critical and how important it is to have every gram of food safe, stored safely, and available for consumption. When we are seeing the cons consumption of stables had spiked uh, due to the uh, current situation of COVID-19, 
and how critical it is to ensure that farmers who are working and worked hard to produce their food, that they have it safe, stored safely for their needs and available for the market when they need it uh, or when uh, they, there is a need and demand for it. Um, under the post harvest loss uh, innovation lab, we have studied and researched several technologies and several programs uh, that have worked in different countries in order to test, validate, uh, uh, discover what are the technologies available out there to help farmers and processors and aggregators to ensure uh, this thing is exactly thing happening. Post harvest losses can happen in multiple ways. It could happen as a loss and uh, for the uh, in the quantity or physical quantity due to damage uh, by pests or uh, uh, environmental conditions, or it could be also loss on the quality of the food, the nutrient degradation. Uh, it could be also fermentation of the food that will render it unsuitable uh, for human or animal consumption. And nutrient degradation, which means food will be consumed empty of any uh, useful micronutrient, just as uh, if when it, if it's consumed, just will be a source of uh, a, a filler. Um, uh, under the Boss Harvest Laws and under this webinar, we will talk about different uh, technologies uh, that are part of the bigger uh, uh, technologies available out there that could help farmers, producers, aggregators, private sector, conserve and save uh, their uh, harvest uh, as part of a package of technologies that are available out there. There is um, no one can say this is better than other technology. What we're trying to say is to present what USAID uh, under the uh, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and that this one program have done in order to help contribute to addressing this problem. Uh, thank you again for listening. I'm looking forward to an uh, exciting, engaging discussion. Great. Thank you, Ahmed. This is the – sorry, Julie, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just also going to thank Ahmed and pass it over to you, Tucker. Great. Thanks, everyone, and good morning. We're really excited to have such a large and diverse group join us for this important topic today. Um, as we all know, we're facing stark global threats to food and nutritional security today. But as a research and development community, we've been confr confronting a lot of these challenges for some time now. So today, we're considering an essential key to reducing poverty, to improving nutrition, and keeping farmers, communities, and countries from backsliding in the face of multiple shocks that they're facing right now. Resilient communities have the ability to withstand shocks, such as drought that can threaten harvests uh, and disease. Now more than ever, uh, it's critical that we safeguard our hard-won harvests for the benefit of all. So if we consider um, an already bleak year was forecasted for severe hunger and famine, uh, and the added or covariate shock of the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to set back progress on improved livelihoods if left unchecked. So as we consider post-harvest losses and the role that addressing those can play in uh, ensuring that um, communities are resilient, uh, there are a few key facts that stand out. Up to a third or more of what is produced and harvested is lost after harvest. In sub-Saharan Africa, grain losses alone to post-harvest loss are greater than all U.S. global food aid. But these losses are readily addressable through targeted research for development. And the, the approach that we take and many other innovation labs take is to enhance national capacity, so capacity development and to tailor and validate adapted interventions that can be deployed in our partner countries. If we consider the research investments, uh, only 95%, up to 95% of research investments are on the production side versus 5% on the post-harvest side. So this fairly small amount of relative investment stands to play a tremendous role in safeguarding food and nutritional security. So um, 
a few days ago, um, the head of FAO, uh, and also Feed the Future themselves, countries and the, the world uh, recognize that we're facing um, a challenge on an unprecedented proportion if it's left unchecked. Um, so with the pandemic and then the other shocks, such as the locusts in East Africa uh, and other things, um, we really need to make sure that we aggressively reduce post-harvest loss. We need to save everything in a stable and safe and nutritious state that we've harvested. Post-harvest mitigations have been shown to reduce hunger, increase income and nutritional status, and post-harvest loss innovations and partnerships are available and ready to be scaled and being scaled in ways that would address the pandemic spread, but also reduce food security issues related to that. So post-harvest loss issues uh, have common biophysical drivers and common features uh, that farmers around the world uh, face. So here on the left, you can see that in Kenya in 2010, when I just moved there, uh, the Kenyan government found that there were high levels of a fungal toxin from a fungus that naturally occurs in the environment and produces a toxin called aflatoxin. They found that there were high levels of aflatoxin in the maize or corn harvest, and they condemned the, the, the maize harvest for eastern Kenya. Obviously, that's an important thing to address and, and a big challenge to, to confront that, and that's one of the issues that we're working on. But also here in the U.S., we have mycotoxins also threatening U.S. corn harvests, and it was, uh, it was estimated that in a bad climatic year, we could have up to $1.6 billion of losses in corn uh, in a bad year just due to aflatoxin here in the U.S. So as Ahmed was uh, was introducing us, there are a range of different types of post-harvest losses. First, there are post-harvest losses to stored product crops. So these are durable, they can be stored for a long time, they include uh, grains, legumes, roots, tubers, oil seeds. Also post-harvest losses are, are a critical factor in horticultural products and perishables that require a cold chain and also in animal source foods. So although we're going to be focusing on a narrow section of this today, uh, but an important section, stored product crops, uh, there's a community in research for development and in the innovation labs which are addressing other features of post-harvest losses as well. And here on the right, you can see some pictures from our, our lab's work in Nepal where we found um, aflatoxin is an issue in corn and chilies, you can see there. So, and we found ways that we can address that. So there are quantity losses. So if you have insect pests, like the, the brucids on the chickpeas there on the bottom, uh, they can cause quantity losses of the stored grains, uh, but also quality losses as well, which can have important impacts on, on economic impacts and health impacts. As Ahmed said, it, you can have degraded nutrient content but also food safety issues, which can spike with shocks. They can get worse if you have added shocks. So again, these fungal toxins, these mycotoxins are a critical issue globally, but also pesticide residues. And some of the interventions we have to mitigate post-harvest loss can actually eliminate the need to use pesticides, which are often used dangerously, if at all, in a lot of our partner countries. So what we're working towards is really a marketplace of post-harvest interventions. It's not one size fits all. Uh, there are a lot of drying and storage interventions that are already available on the marketplace. Uh, and given that we're working with so many different commodities, with so many different socioeconomic challenges with the different actors and the farmers, the aggregators along the value chain, we need to come together and we are coming together as a community to make this marketplace of post-harvest loss interventions available. So one of the keys to addressing post-harvest loss is drying and storage. Uh, that's one of the main things that we focus on. But also processing is critical uh, because this can help in terms of preserving nutrient content and shelf life and adding value. Also, it's important to have diversified uses. So if, despite our best efforts, even here in the U.S., we still have contamination by these mycotoxins. 
And as awareness raises in our partner countries and, um, and people become aware of them, we need to make sure that the contaminated commodities are not focused in on the most vulnerable and least informed consumers. So our innovation lab, uh, the post-harvest loss innovation lab, has been running since 2014. Uh, we've worked in four core countries, Guatemala, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. And we've helped address uh, mission and in-country priorities in Afghanistan, Nepal, and Honduras as well. And we have, uh, we have worked to enhance human and institutional capacity in every country. And we have drying storage and extension innovations available for transfer. So we have a diversified research for development strategy. First, we align with Feed the Future and mission priorities because we're all part of one team in empowering our national partners to address key constraints to agriculture and health. We empower national research leaders. These are really the, the change agents and the champions to addressing these problems. We conduct multidisciplinary research to inform evidence-based stakeholder-driven strategies. And again, we cultivate a marketplace of innovations, not just from our program, for, but from all over the place uh, for different value chain actors. And we use private sector partnerships, as you'll see today, uh, to reach and propel innovations into use. It's not enough just to research them. We need to, to have the right research questions and partnerships to get them into scaling. And we aim to leave a more resilient system. And when we step back from our project, have self-sustaining post-harvest loss mitigation measures. So today, we'll hear from, from George Opet. Uh, and Georgina Bingham, and we're focusing in on one of our countries, Ghana. So the importance of addressing, addressing post-harvest loss of that along the value chain to help establish scaling path, pathways for information and technology, but also to benefit more consumers is really critical. There have been continuing challenges to scaling different technologies, such as hermetic bags. So our, our strategy is diversified. We're working with smallholder farmers the private sector, and also poultry farmers as well. Uh, poultry are critical in nutrition and food security and to uh, alleviate poverty. Along with milk, eggs are one of the highest nutrient content foods. And poultry are a stepping stone out of poverty, especially for women. So as we discussed today, please consider we have innovations that are starting to scale, and we're eager to partner to see them secure the harvest. Thank you. Yeah, um, the Innovation Lab uh, for the Reduction of Post-Harvest Loss uh, is using post-harvest loss mitigation technologies to build resilience in poultry farms in Doma, Ghana, and that is the focus of my presentation. The PHLIL Ghana team uh, comprises the management entity, uh, the in-country coordinator, and private sector players. And this work with researchers from the fields of entomology, art engineering, engagement, gender and youth, and food safety. These researchers are drawn from multiple disciplines and from multiple institutions. They are collecting information that should increase you know, the adoption of the grain meat moisture tester and zero fly hematic banks. From the perspective of PHLIL, operations management factors that increase profitability should also enhance resilience of a poultry business. Some of the challenges that are faced by poultry farmers in Doma, Ghana, that are targeted by PHLIL include Seasonal maize price fluctuation. In Ghana, maize prices between seasonal harvests can even double or more than double. Feed-based fluctuations in egg production and feed-based mortality of birds are other challenges faced by these poultry farmers. The last two challenges on this slide can be caused by poor quality feed. And that poor quality feed 
can be a result of using maize, which is heavily infested by insects, for the preparation of the feed. That poor quality feed, too, can be a result of using maize, which is high in mycotoxin levels for the preparation of the feed. PSLIL is addressing these challenges by working to increase the use of the grain mate moisture tester and zero fly hematic bags by poultry farmers. The grain mate moisture tester is currently made in Kumasi, Ghana by Sisi Technologies. Each of these devices costs about 500 to 550 Ghana cities, which is the equivalent of 90 to 100 US dollars. The zero fly hematic bags are made by Bagco in Kano, Nigeria. Each of these bags sells for 9 to 12 Ghana cities, which is equivalent of 1.6 to 2.2 US dollars. More on the solutions to these challenges. Seasonal price fluctuations can be addressed through long-term self-storage of maize. Feed-based fluctuations in egg production and mortality of birds can be addressed using good quality maize. Grain meat and zero fly hematic bags facilitate both long-term self-storage of maize and also the availability of good quality maize. PHLIL is working to increase the use of grain meat and zero fly hematic bags by poultry farmers through conducting on-farm demonstrations. We have found that these demonstrations are quite effective. And these demonstrations typically involve explaining in detail to the poultry farmer and their staff on how the grain meat moisture tester works. It also involves explaining in detail why it's important for each poultry farm to own a moisture tester. In the last 12 months, of the 103 devices that have been sold in Ghana, 22 have been purchased by poultry farmers in Doma. The demonstrations also involve side-by-side -side comparisons of storage of maize in zero-fly hematic bags and polypropylene bags. Polypro polypropylene bags are the common method for the storage of maize in Ghana. These demonstrations last three months, at the end of which maize in each of the bags is weighed. And then also the quality of maize in each bag is assessed. From the demonstrations that we have conducted, on average, over the three months, the maize in the polypropylene bag loses a weight of roughly 10%. The weight of the maize in the zero fly hematic bags, on the other hand, remains more or less the same. The quality of the maize in the zero fly hematic bag also remains more or less the same. These demonstrations have been very powerful and convincing because they're conducted in the setting of the poultry farmer's own storehouse. It involves you know, the poultry farmer and their staff participating in setting up the demonstration and they're using their own maize. Of the roughly 5,500 zero fly hematic bags that have been sold, to Ghana in the, sold in Ghana in the last 18 months, Approximately 3,700 of these have been purchased by poultry farmers in Doma. As of right now, there are a number of pending orders by these poultry farmers for the purchase of zero hematic bags when they are supplying. I'm now going to take a moment to tell you about the Evans Jones Poultry Farm. And I do this as a way of highlighting, you know, some of the successes that we've had as PHLIL 
in increasing the use of zero fry hematic bags by poultry farmers. Evan Jones Poultry Farm is owned by Evan and Josephine Yeboah. When we first met them late in 2017, their poultry farm had only 5,000 birds. 5,000 birds. Evan and Josephine had not heard about the grain meat moisture tester. They had not heard about zero fly hematic bags. So we set up the demonstrations of the two technologies just like I described a few minutes ago. And shortly after those demonstrations were completed, Evans and Josephine purchased and started to effectively use the two technologies. Fast forward to today, Evans Jones Poultry Farm has grown by five times. They have 25,000 birds. 25,000 parts. As of right now, they have maize in 1,750 zero fly hematic bags. As you can see on that picture on the left, those are some of the 1,750 hematic bags that contain that maize. In fact, Evans and Josephine are requesting to be supplied more bags so that they can purchase them to store the rest of their maize, which currently is in PP bags, for safe, long-term storage. Evans and Josephine are also marketing agents for the zero fly hematic bags in Doma. And the example has made you know, the marketing of the bags much easier among the poultry farmers. Some of the things that PHLIL is working on right now and be working on in the near future include importation of 45,000 zero fly hematic bags from Nigeria to meet the current demand in Ghana. We're also working to optimize the distribution channels for zero fly hematic bags. And we're working to increase the use of hematic bags by smallholder farmers and by aggregators in northern Ghana. A good percentage of the maize which is used by poultry farmers in Doma comes from northern Ghana. Therefore, it's of interest to us that that maize is of good quality. Already, there is some use of hematic bags in northern Ghana. For example, some of the crop aggregation centers are using pig's bags. Late in 2019, we're also able to sell 750 zero fly hematic bags in northern Ghana. Some of the research areas that PHLIL is working on right now include looking at how storing maize in zero fly hematic bags affects broiler performance when that maize is used for the preparation of feed. We're also investigating whether heaping maize on elevated platforms in the field can result in a reduction of mycotoxin contamination. We're also investigating small-scale kernel sorting as a means to mitigate mycotoxin contamination. We are also working to identify ways to increase the participation of women and youth in technology adoption. And lastly, we are researching to identify training methods that can be very effective in promoting technology adoption. I hope with the information that I provided, I have given you an idea of how PHLIL is using post-harvest loss mitigation technologies to increase resilience in poultry farms in Doma, Ghana. Uh, thank you so much, George, and I think we can move on to Sorry. Georgina. Thank you, Julie. Um, are you able to hear me just fine? Uh, yes, you sound clear to me. Perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, George, for that fantastic introduction um, to the projects we've been working on, and to Jaga Ahmed for setting the scene. Um, and then I'd particularly like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. Um, that's a lot of people that we've got listening into us, and I hope you're going to enjoy this, these talks. Um, Georgina, I would like to sorry to interrupt you. Can you just uh, speak up a little bit louder? Sure. Thank you. So I would like, I would like to take um, this opportunity to walk you through a journey that started back in 2010, when the company that I work for decided to develop a food security portfolio, in addition to establish public health and water purification businesses. So I'll take this presentation in two parts starting off by explaining the development, optimization, valid, and validation of a new post-harvest storage technology that you've already met in the previous presentation. Then move on to describe a new decentralized, community-based, peer-to-peer, micro-warehouse trading platform for food commodities that's been specifically designed for engaging smallholder farmers. Um, and it's supported by a mobile app that's similar to Airbnb and Alibaba, which I'm sure many of you have come across, um, that allows direct training, uh, trading between smallholders and entrepreneurs who can then share profits later via mobile banking and also get increased access to technologies, markets, and they can share knowledge. I've been working for Vestergaard, a Swiss-based family-owned global health company working under a humanitarian and entrepreneurship business model for over 10 years, and we focus on developing tools for the most vulnerable in society. And we're perhaps better known for our long-lasting insecticidal malaria bed nets and live straw water purification tools. Um, but in 2010, the company, as I mentioned, decided to branch out and add food security to its agenda, um, particularly with an impending food security crisis. And as Jagger has pointed out this morning, that's likely to be upon us much sooner than we had expected with uh, the current pandemic. So our food security team has been working together with several partners, in particular, as you've seen, the Post Harvest Innovation Lab and also USDA to develop post-harvest storage loss mitigation tools. And over the last 10 years, we have taken the technology to approved for long-lasting insecticidal malaria bed nets to prevent insects from entering or, for that matter, leaving food storage bags. A huge issue, as has been already excellently explained by Professor Opitz. Uh, with one single fumigation, these insecticidal bags could allow our food to be stored for up to two years. So this unique packaging technology required, as you can imagine, vigorous evaluation and validation to ensure not just its ability to protect the nutritional content of food, durability for multiple heavy uses over 24 months. Uh, but also, probably most importantly, its safety profile. This technology allows a controlled release of a WHO, FAO, EPA approved insecticide called deltamethrin that moves to the surface of the bag material um, in just the right amount to stop the insect damage. This means that there's no need for spraying or mixing of insecticides into the food that also significantly reduces exposure of pesticides within the environment and also to end users. Oh, I missed the most important part, apologies. The food commodities um, that we tested were also analyzed throughout the lifetime of the bag. This ensures none of the insecticide residues are above the US EPA and EU codex limits. And then we also did various toxicological evaluations 
confirming the safety for users and consumers alike, including children that may be contacting the bags. So in collaboration with the Post Harvest Innovation Lab and other partners, we realized early on that if we were to reach our target group, smallholder farmers, even one fumigation wasn't appropriate. So we reached out to experts in the hermetic bag field, PICS, Grain Pro, um, and global food packaging experts, and they advised us and suggested various different options um, for us to be able to add one single hermetic liner inside this treat insecticide treated outer bag. So I always think that a picture tells a thousand words. And here we can see the standard polypropylene woven storage bags with one fumigation after a year's storage in the foreground. The bags are almost completely destroyed by, by insects. Um, I can tell you if you go and touch those bags, they'll crumble and almost fall apart. Um, and it's heartbreaking to see all that crop loss. Um, but the stack at the rear shows the undamaged and intact zero fly bags. And as I mentioned earlier, these bags have been validated by um, Professor Opitz's group um, under the Post Harvest Innovation Lab. And I just took a few snapshots of some of their excellent publications. Um, just for your information. So once we reach the market with a post-harvest storage technology that finally seems appropriate for smallholder farmers, and even at a simil similar price point to other hermetic bags, the price still seemed too high for the, small, for the, for the poorest farmers. So we had to go again and, and redesign the bag with the aim, um, internally we gave ourselves the challenge to be half the price of hermetic bags in the market, including our own first generation insecticidal bag with hermetic liner. And the idea that the business and engineering teams came up with was to not only laminate or coat the insecticide on the outside of a standard polypropylene bag, but also laminate a specialized hermetic layer too. This cuts the plastic required in half. And so, as you can see here, reduce the bag price from $1 right the way down to 50 cents, which is cost price. So we were pretty excited at this point. And so, this also meant that we could start to develop local production, as the film with the special properties could be shipped to standard bag producers. This can be done in pellet form, film on rolls, um, but it's only a fraction of the weight of shipping entire bags and separate liners. Thus, we were able to significantly reduce our carbon footprint, time to market, and cost even further. You can see on the right-hand side the layers um, of this new specialized bag. So we start with the standard woven bag, and then we have a blue layer, and then we have um, EVOH, which is the hermetic barrier, and then another glue layer to tie it all together, and then lamination containing the insecticide. One of the key issues um, impacting global food security in developing countries is that smallholders, who account for 50% of foods produced globally, don't have the available cash flow to store large parts of their harvest and lack safe access to affordable crop storage. And as we've heard already, insects feeding on the crops after the harvest multiply and destroy the economic economic nutritive value of the crops within two to four months, and after six to nine months, these foods become completely inedible. inedible. Insects can also increase molds um, within these, these food commodities, and these molds produce substances called aflatoxins, um, 
Dr. Jagger talked about a little bit. And these are linked to higher rates of liver cancer, stunting that's observed in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Smallholders have, find themselves in this um, kind of poverty harvest, poverty trap, and are forced to sell their crops just after harvest when the prices are low to cover loans, expenses from the year past, and they're not able to benefit from price increases in the months following the main harvest. Since they can't sell, since they can't keep, sorry, crops throughout the year, they are forced to buy back in the lean season when the prices are high. And it's this um, sell low, buy high behavior that traps smallholders in poverty very often. So clearly it's not just technology that's lacking in these communities. The current value chain is simply not favorable to smallholder farmers. So we wondered what if we could disrupt the system and address the challenges, and what would that look like? It would need to be close to the farmers, run by local entrepreneurs, cost efficient, safe, easy to use, decentralized, moving away from the warehouse receipt model, scalable, and perhaps most importantly based on sharing profit back to the farmers themselves. And so Chombo was born. Chombo means container in Swahili. And the first pilot was designed in Kenya using shipping containers. So the name arrived and seemed to stick. The Zero Fly Chombo platform um, consists of a starter pack that allows the operation of a local micro warehouse, um, a local entrepreneur, where post-harvest losses are reduced to almost zero using the hermetic bags. The other platform component um, is a mobile application, and it allows farmers, micro warehouses, and consumers to be connected um, and able to buy and sell crops. The payments are done through the app. Oh, I've lost my slides. Sorry about that, Georgina. We'll get them back. It's okay. Just one moment. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I can keep talking about it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, in payments, um, payments are done through the app, um, which allows the platform to automatically share typically 40 to 80 percent micro warehouse profits with the farmers when prices rise after a period of storage. The size of the profit share is generally adjusted lo based on local conditions. But since micro warehouses take on all the risk, it makes sense that a big part of the profit would naturally stay with them. So what we've been working with is a split of 10 to 15 percent of the profit going back to the farmers. So what this does is it affords smallholder farmers, entrepreneurs, some protection against these price fluctuations and decreases risk of price shocks in this vulnerable market. Also, since the Chombo app-based transaction model does away with the need for physical money exchange or hard copy agreements, it enables reduced person-to-person -person contact, potentially reducing impact of diseases like Ebola, COVID-19, on food security and the economy. It also provides an opportunity for directly scaling out tools that bolster the resiliency of low-income farmers, such as these hermetic bags, the moisture meter Professor Opert described, seeds, dryers, um, and also sharing information on good agricultural practices. It also allows the possibility of sending out messages um, with information such as how to stay safe during a disease outbreak. The profit share that the farmers receive can be used to finance inputs um, in kind profit, um, partially or fully, um, to share directly for the next harvest season. Um, but these parameters need to be co-developed with communities, farmers, and micro-warehouses. 
So with this platform, Best About aims to ensure the use of the knowledge already gained and provide ready link up of farmers to the end users within the Chombo community that would not otherwise be possible. In order to test this business model, a pilot in Western Kenya was designed with the intention to demonstrate how agriculture can lift the most vulnerable people out of poverty in rural areas of developing countries. The pilot consisted of three sponsored entrepreneurs at three locations, and they were given loans to buy grains and zero-fly hermetic bags for safe storage at harvest. The buying price at that time in 2018 was $90 a ton. That was August, I believe, July, August. And then the selling price uh, nine months later uh, in May 2019 was $300, giving them a whopping profit of $210 US dollars per ton over a nine month period. So together with the Post Harvest Innovation Lab, we have managed to merge research, private sector scaling potential with some really exciting results. The next stage, building on the successful pilot in Kenya, will be to establish a scaling business model, establishing 500 to 1,000 zero-fly micro warehouses over the next year in Kenya, and to bring this to at least 2,000 micro warehouses during the next three years. Next year, we plan to bring this platform to Ghana and Nigeria. And below is a YouTube video just giving you some more details about this Chombo model. As a company, we sat down and developed the following quite ambitious targets based on the sustainable development goals and are actively looking for partnerships in order to make these goals a reality. And with that, I just really want to say thank you to our fantastic partners and to all of you to take the time to join me on this journey. And I hope everyone stays well and safe during these difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Georgina, George, Jagger, and Ahmed. Uh, and thank you so much to our participants. You have put a ton of great questions into the chat box. And uh, we are ready to begin addressing as many of them as we can. All right. Let's see. Um, so, really, first, can I oh, just yes, talk go ahead. Sure. So, thanks, everyone. And I just wanted to reiterate that this is a, a global problem, these post harvest loss issues. The farmers in our partner countries, uh, such as this farmer here in Uganda and sorghum farmers right here in Kansas are facing the same biophysical factors. So as we seek to confront these uh, abroad, there are lessons that we bring back here to safeguard US agriculture and vice versa. So it's really a win-win type of partnership that we're engaged in. And so as we look forward, as we look forward into the lean season after the most recent harvest, and each time we do that, what we're really asking is for our, our partner farmers and our target beneficiaries to stem the loss of, of uh, calories and, and nutrients as they traverse this bleak, uh, lean, or hunger season. So here, a local artist in Kansas uh, painted this. And you can see, here's a smallholder farmer who's just gotten through the harvest, a really hard one harvest. And she needs to feed her family and get income for her family until the next harvest, if that is successful. So working together, I'm confident that we can take an aggressive approach to reducing post-harvest loss. It's great to see so many people and so many experts in different uh, levels uh, and taking different approaches on here. So uh, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jagger. All right, we have about half an hour to address your questions. And so I think we'll go ahead and, and dive right in. And Georgina, I thought we could um, kick off. I noticed that there were a number of individuals in the chat box asking about whether the bags are available in their particular country. Um, we had questions from Uganda, Ethiopia, Dominican Republic, Nigeria, um, and a, a few others, and just interested about how the access might be growing uh, in different countries. And I thought perhaps you could 
let people know how they can figure out or find out when they can access these bags? That is a great question, um, and it's something we've been working on for um, from since the beginning that we uh, developed these bags because these bags require registration in the various countries, which takes time. Um, currently, I think we're registered in 17 countries globally, um, and we have or are developing local production in we have local production, our local production in Vietnam, Thailand, and um, and then we're working with partners in Nigeria and Kenya um, to produce these bags. Um, and currently, the work that Professor Opet is doing in Ghana, um, he'll be using the supplier in, in Nigeria. Um, but we with the with the um, uh, use of local production. Um, this is going to improve our reach. As I said in my talk, it's going to make it easier to get bags to where they need to be at the right time um, and at the right price point. Um, so if they wanted to, if the if we can maybe after the, the the webinar we can list off the different countries and I can get back to separate people to check on whether we are in those countries. Um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Let's see, I, I'm going to throw it back um, to a, the first question, actually, that came in uh, for Jagger, and then we'll come back to some more questions on the zero fly bags. Um, so Axon Wanza asked, apart from the 95% production and 5% post-harvest investment, uh, what proportion accounts for investment in value addition or food processing? in FSA? Great, thank you, and that's a great question. Um, I can say that there's definitely significant investments across both the drying and storage spaces and the value addition spaces. Uh, I don't have an exact number, uh, but if we consider USAID's investments in the innovation labs, uh, they've invested in our lab, which focuses on drying and storage. The Food Processing Innovation Lab, which focuses primarily on the value addition out of Purdue University. The Sorghum and Millet Innovation Lab here at, K at Kansas State University. The Horticulture Innovation Lab, which recently wrapped up at UC Davis. So um, in terms of teasing out an exact proportion, I don't have that figure. However, there is across multiple different value chains and grains and horticultural crops and animal source foods there, there are definitely complementary and significant investments on both sides. Uh, thank you, Jagger. And as long as I have you, perhaps I'll uh, also address a couple of questions about uh, data availability. One came in from Stephen Walsh um, asking or mentioning that yield gap analysis has been a useful framework for assessing where to invest on the production side is there a corollary for post-harvest loss? Um, and then we had also had uh, Michael Omodara ask about, uh, or mention that collecting data on post-harvest loss uh, and other related issues is a major problem in Africa. And if your innovation lab is working on that issue in any regard. That's great. Thanks, Julie, and thanks for these questions. Absolutely, we need to know the enemy. We need to know the the, the drivers of post-harvest loss before we really prioritize and, and design and scale out interventions. So, uh, Stephen, that's that's a great question. And it's been the lack of good data on the extent of BHL and the drivers of post-harvest loss has been a, a critical gap. Uh, FAO has recently launched the Food Loss Index, which is trying to tackle that. And as we as an innovation lab have, have moved into each of our countries, that's one of the, the first gaps, really, that we try and address, is working with our national partners to design surveys and to understand, really, what are the drivers of post-harvest loss. Um, and that was one of the first things that our innovation lab did was those studies. And then from there, uh, we can prioritize uh, which, which ones that we're going to, going to tackle and how. Uh, and so Michael's question on uh, what was that again? Sorry. There are so many good questions. 
I know. <laughs> um, let's see. It was um, oh, okay. just recognizing Thank that you're collecting yeah. data on post harvest loss, mycotoxins, and other related issues is a, a challenge in Africa uh, and elsewhere. And what are innovation labs doing in that regard? Yeah, so um, what we're doing really is we want to make sure that we not only address the specific research issues and challenges that, that we're directly working on within a project, but we really work to establish labs and research teams in country so that they can work beyond the projects with us to address these issues. Because mycotoxins and post-harvest losses are, are readily addressable with the right research and, and development um, approaches. However, they're very diverse and, and there's a lot of them. So, so essentially what we do is we, we make sure that we do targeted research uh, with our in-country partners playing a leading role uh, and so that we do characterize specific mycotoxin issues and post-harvest issues and find the types of um, innovations, so technologies, extension materials that can address them, uh, but then also leave behind uh, a uh, leadership in the research space, uh, people who are trusted by the general public, who are empowered by their national systems to address these problems so they can continue well beyond when, when our projects finish. Uh, thanks so much, Jagger. Let's see. We had, um, yeah, I'm coming through all of these uh, wonderful questions that came in. So let's see. I will um, address one to Georgina that came in several times, um, which is a question about whether the hermetic bags are effective against rats or is it mostly against insects. Um, and we also had a question asking whether they are effective in reducing uh, brucid damage. So perhaps a little bit more description of what they protect against. Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, so the uh, insecticide that we use um, is an insecticide. It's not a rodenticide. But we've seen a lot of, um, in our field trials, we've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence that um, rodents are deterred by the um, insecticide bags. Um, and also, when you have a hermetic bag, um, I think PIX has some nice data to show that um, when the bags are hermetic, uh, rodents are also less interested. I, I presume it's because they can't really smell what's inside, um, what goodies lie inside. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't have uh, what I feel is strong scientific evidence to say one way or another, but um, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence, and a lot of users say that they see this phenomenon of uh, rodents moving away from these these bags. And um, brigids, yeah, um, we have tested a plethora of species, all the key species, primary and secondary, um, together with the USDA and uh, Professor Opitz from OSU, um, and we have found that. Um, Brickets included um, are able to be killed by the by the uh, zero fly in the bag. So, so Georgina, um, on the issue of the rodents, uh, I totally concur because for some of the stakeholders uh, who are storing, you know, their maize in both, you know, the polypropylene bags and you know the zero fly hermetic bags in the same storehouse, uh, this is the feedback you get from them, uh, and. Maybe it would be a different story uh, if they had no choice, uh, because you know the rodents are attacking, uh, you know the ba the maize which is in PP, ba PP bags, but not the one in zero fire hematic bags, and whether that's because they have you know that choice. So what would happen uh, if all the maize uh, is in zero fire hematic bags? Um, that's the different story that needs to be investigated. But for now, there's anecdotal evidence that, you know, the rodents stay away from, you know, the zero fire hematic bags. Thank you, George. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, a number of people asked about the difference between the zero fly hermetic bags and the PICS bags that were introduced by Purdue University uh, several years ago, and their differences in terms of effectiveness in reducing post-harvest losses and reuse. And uh, I know that Jagger was interested in addressing that. 
Great, thank you, and that's a great question. So, again, post-harvest loss issues are so diverse, um, and we're agnostic to where a technology comes from. Hermetic bags are a very effective technology to reduce post-harvest losses. And across our program, we've we've looked at which technologies are the best suited in terms of, of course, efficacy, but also local availability, in some cases, local production. Uh, and so we have actually used zero fly hermetic bags, picks, and grain pro, grain pro bags across our program. So it's really important that we not go in to our project in the research for development community with prescribed answers, but rather work with our national partners um, so that we can make sure that we work with stakeholders and we convene major stakeholder platforms to consider the range of interventions that could be brought to bear to solve these problems and really have a marketplace of, of these technologies and information available because it's through that that really these national systems are, are going to be able to, to sustainably address these challenges. Thank you very much, Jagger. Let's see. All right. Um, we have uh, we've had a number of just questions about specific um, elements of the zero fly hermetic bags, and so I thought I'd try and run through a few different ones. Um, so perhaps to Georgina uh, Paradiazi Holzonge asked, "How long do the zero fly hermetic bags last?" How many times can they be used? Sorry, I was on mute. No problem. <laughs> um, so, um, as I uh, as I uh, was talking in my presentation, um, we talk about twenty-four months, but they last, as you'd imagine, um, as all all, all hermetic bags. Um, so. Um, but the data that I have and the publications we have um, with the current formulation is definitely up to 24 months at least. Um, excellent. And I noticed that um, uh, Deba Wako also asked, can you change the zero fly bags to new bags in order to prolong uh, the storage time of grain? We sure can. It just makes the bag a little more expensive. There are various things that we can do. We have other products within the food security portfolio um, that I've worked with the teams to develop. And depending on the additives you bring in, um, you can make them last uh, even longer. Um, but again, that comes with a price tag. Sure, understood. Um, and then another clarification, since the bags are chemically treated, can they be reused? I think it wasn't clear about whether they can be used more than once? Yes, absolutely. Multi-use. Okay. Excellent. Um, let's see. We also had um, let's see, a couple of questions about, or a, a concern about whether the uh, chemical infused in the bag could cause any food safety issues for the grain inside. Is that a potential issue? Um, so this was one of our first, our very first concerns, obviously, um, as a company. And we designed some very vigorous tests and evaluations to ensure um, that any insecticide which did get onto the grain um, would be well below um, safe limits as prescribed by US EPA and EU Codex. Um, but currently, since we have the um, hermetic barrier um, between the insecticide and the food, um, there's almost no residue getting into the food at all anymore. So, um, so this is really great. Great, thank you. Let's see. Coming through these excellent questions. Thank you all so much for engaging in the chat box um, and also for sharing yourself some answers to others' questions. That's um, a wonderful way to engage. Let's see. Um, George, I think 
hold on one moment, just lost my question for you. Let me find it once again. All right. Uh, all right, George, an interesting question came in from Michael Omodara, uh, which is, George, when do you think Africa will move away from bag storage? Despite the success stories recorded with the use of picks and other bags, uh, the majority of farmers still use the woven PPE. Do you think the bag storage system in itself might need to be changed in the future? Well, 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 of course, that's a good question. Um, so again, if we are to move away from you know bag storage to bag storage, uh, you need you know to develop the infrastructure to get that done. So I don't know uh, whether we're in the position to do that in Africa yet, okay? So as far as I'm concerned, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, probably bag storage is, is going to be there in Africa. Uh, and again, I think the simple answer to that is, you know, uh, there's a whole infrastructure that has to develop around bag storage. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I also wanted to um, mention, in, George, in one of the examples that you gave, uh, you were discussing both maize and poultry farmers. But who is turning the maize into poultry feed? Is there an extra step there that wasn't addressed? Yeah. So. Uh, that's a good question. The way the poultry farms uh, in Doma operate, and uh, this is really caused by a number of reasons, uh, most of the poultry farms prepare their own feed. They have a formula for that. And this is because there's lack of consistency uh, if they are to get this feed, you know, from, you know, an agro um, uh, input deal or something like that, okay? So a lot of them prefer to buy the maize. Uh, buy all the ingredients that go into the uh, preparation of that feed and do it in their own poultry farm. So their best case scenario is, okay, buy as, make, uh, as much maize as possible so that you beat the price fluctuations, store it as simple as you can, uh, make your own feed uh, so that you can guarantee, you know, that consistency uh, in the feed. You make the feed that you want. So again, the poultry farmer is buying the maize, are storing it and making it own fit. So that's how it works. Thank you, George. Um, all right. Uh, we've had some questions come in that go a little bit beyond uh, the storage bag question, but ask some more general questions about post-harvest loss and perishability, um, and thought I could uh, pose a few of those. And so one of them was from Marquendi Desormeau, who asked a question about highly perishable products and smallholder farmers. What is the alternative for small-scale farmers in post-harvest management of very perishable products, which would otherwise require cool storage? Is that something that the post-harvest loss innovation lab is looking into? Yeah, so we're not specifically looking into that, but I will give you an example of, of how we partner to look into that. So in our work in Nepal, we looked at where aflatoxins are found because the Nutrition Innovation Lab had found uh, high levels of exposure to aflatoxins in, in pregnant women in Banki. And so our lab came in and partnered with them and looked at where are aflatoxins found in the food supply, what's the source of that. And one of the things that we found was that there were aflatoxins and chilies. So the Horticulture Innovation Lab has chimney dryers that can be, uh, that can be assembled locally and that were being already piloted in Nepal. So, so we talked with them and they were piloting those chimney dryers to dry the chilies. Um, other more highly perishable Foods I know can be can be dried and stored, but you do have a loss of nutrient content. So then there's also um, questions around how to get the cold chain in place, and that is something that that the post harvest loss innovation lab is, is not specifically focused on. We we partner on those issues. Okay. 
Thanks so much, Jagger. Uh, Julie, this is Ahmed, if I may add. Sure. Uh, yeah, a great question. And um, in a similar project we did in the in, in Bangladesh with the Nutrition Innovation Lab and the Horticulture Innovation Lab, where they uh, looked at different technologies available for drying. Um, the, the project started with looking at horticulture and fish value chain, and then we realized quickly that food safety related to storage and perishability of the food, as well as uh, uh, the nutrient degradation is an issue. So they collaborated and they started thinking about different technologies. One of the things that they tested is the cool box, which is, as Jagger mentioned, from the Horticultural Innovation Lab, uh, have been developed. Uh, and it, they have the off-grid and the on-grid cool bus. And the, the issue that had been found with the cool bus adoption, it is the initial cost point. Is, uh, if there is someone or the government or others are willing to provide this for farmers, they, are, you, they will use it. Uh, but the initial cost is a hindering factor. The other thing we tested in Bangladesh was uh, the solar dryer. And as you know, the solar dryer, there is different uh, uh, system or different design, but they all do the same function where you are concentrating the sun heat in uh, a platform and there is a vent uh, where the uh, moisture will evaporate through it. And there could be a fan to draw the air or, might, or sometimes there is no fan. And that also works to dry high value crops like mango and others, as well as fish. Um, the, at the point that Jagger mentioned, and I saw one of the questions related to the nutrient degradation when you dry it. And dehydration is known, it's an old, uh, not a new method, method to conserve uh, and preserve fruits and vegetables, especially high value crops, um, as well as some uh, animal source food like uh, fish and uh, others. Um, the factor that could help reduce the nutrient loss is the rate at which you dry, the speed of drying, and the temperature. And all of these things, um, so that's why there's some of the solar dryers that are designed for fruits and vegetables. They have vents in order to control, to lower the temperature. If you are using it for something uh, that's heat sensitive and uh, you don't want the temperature to be above 120 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit because that will increase the rate of degradation but you want to maintain that temperature where you expedite the loss of moisture from and dehydrated. So uh, there is technology available, and the rate of degradation of nutrients and started usually with some of the heat-sensitive uh, uh, micronutrients like vitamin C. You can control mm -hmm. it by controlling the temperature, but it is something that needs uh, further validation for different types of crops. Uh, Thank you so much, Ahmed. All right, we had a number of questions come in about adoption, uh, what the adoption rate has been of the grain mates and zero fly hermetic bags, um, and what types of uh, methods could be used to help scale the bags. And we thought, Jagger, perhaps you could address that. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And as an innovation lab, we've made sure to include expertise and research on engagement and questions around the barriers to adoption. It's not enough just to make sure that a technology works in a biophysical sense to stop the, stop the post-harvest loss issue. Um, so what we've done is we've partnered with AgReach at University of Illinois and uh, also Scientific Animations Without Borders at, at Michigan State University. And we're asking research questions about adoption, about the best type of extension tools, about the how to um, best empower local small and medium enterprises and um, early change agents and adopters so that they can get some of these technologies out there. So it's very much part of our considerations and research. And I know that in Ghana, George and Georgina have been looking at um, adoption uh, mechanisms and strategies to get the zero fly hermetic bags and the grain mate moisture meter that SESI Technologies uh, run by Isaac SESI, a recent graduate of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. So, so we are looking at adoption and, and they are beginning to, to scale. Yeah. Uh, Jagger, can I add a little bit to that? Uh, very Please, good. Yeah. Uh, 
one of the things I want to add is that it's not by accident that we're working with poultry farmers in Doma. Uh, it's really there's some strategy that is going into that. Why the poultry farmers in Doma? Doma has probably one of the highest concentrations of poultry farms anywhere in West Africa. And why poultry farmers? Well, they're commercially minded. They view agriculture as a business. So they're ready to make investments that they see as going to increase you know, their profit margins. Two, relatively many of them are well educated. Three, they have money that they can invest in these technologies. So that most likely could drive you know, the adoption of the technologies. And lastly, they are quite progressive. They are open-minded. I mean, they are good business people, so they are looking for all kinds of ideas. So, so again, these are some of the things uh, that we are using in Ghana. Say, so, okay, if these guys can be the early adopters, if the poultry farmers in Doma, where you have the highest concentration of the poultry farms situated, can adopt these technologies, it will spread to other poultry farms uh, in the middle belt of Ghana, a few that are in the north. And because these poultry farmers are supplied by smallholder farmers, the information then flows, you know, from there. So, so again, I just wanted to add that, Jaga. Uh, thank you so much. And we have about uh, six or seven minutes left for questions, but we also wanted to bring up some poll questions for you, our audience, uh, as we wrap up. And we just have a number of questions that would be very helpful if you would take a moment to answer. Um, let us know uh, whether this webinar was useful for you. And uh, in the, the bottom rightmost poll question, uh, please feel free to share your suggestions uh, for improvement for AgriLink's webinars going forward, or what you found most helpful about the webinar today. Um, let's see. Georgina, I know that you've been working on a few different answers, kind of rapid-fire answers to some questions that you will post in the chat box. Uh, I also want to note that we've had really an extraordinary number of questions come in today, and uh, we will try in the post-event resources, which we will email out to all of you, to ensure that um, we provide as much information as we can to help answer your additional questions that we weren't able to get to today. Um, all right, Jagger, I uh, wanted to ask you a question from Jane Ambuco, which is, while government, uh, while governments have committed to reduce post-harvest losses to meet the sustainable development goals target of having post-harvest losses uh, or having post-harvest losses by 2030. Allocation of resources to this cause, um, including research, is just 5% compared to the 95% you mentioned to production. So what strategies can be used to get more resources a lot allocated to the important issue of post-harvest loss reduction? Great, thank you. And thanks, Professor Ambuco. It's great to see you on here, and I really have been enjoying all of your contributions in the chat. Yes, as, as a leader yourself in elevating the post-harvest loss on the agenda in, in Kenya and in Africa, um, I, I think what you have been doing and what we're trying to do re really is to build the evidence base uh, by empowering our in-country partners to, to do and publish research, but then also to link them with policymakers to have stakeholder uh, workshops and discussions so that we can raise the profile of post-harvest loss issues, but also the fact that we can readily address them, uh, including on smallholder farms. And then, so another part of that really is making sure that we engage policymakers. So for example, uh, in Nepal, we had members of the National Planning Commission who are at, what are at our national mycotoxin stakeholder workshop. We had members of the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, uh, and others. And really, it helped them to put post-harvest loss and aflatoxin specifically in that case in a broader context. So I think continuing to work together as a community to make sure that we uh, enhance national capacity to conduct this research, to uh, raise the profile of post-harvest loss, 
so that policymakers and others can assess really kind of where what's the cost benefit compared to addressing other issues uh, because there are a lot of issues out there and then we can really have national systems taking it on. I'll just also mention that our Ethiopia team also um, worked with the government and now the Ethiopian government has a national post-harvest advisory committee with high-level membership from the Ministry of Agriculture and others. And again, so if we can make sure that we have the evidence and some early successes on things that are effectively being deployed and, and working in a sustainable way and an inclusive way, uh, we just need to continue along those lines as a community to, um, to make sure we can have as much impact as possible. Great, thank you so much for that important perspective. Okay, um, I think I'll throw out just a couple more questions before we wrap up today. Um, <laughs> We've had just so many good questions come in, it's, it's, it's almost overwhelming, but certainly we, we love to have all of these questions, so thank you so much for submitting them. Uh, all right. Um, I thought one interesting question uh, from Vincent Roger was that, uh, oh, actually, uh, Jagger, I, one question that came in a bit earlier that I think um, you had wanted to answer was some alternative uses for grains that are contaminated with mycotoxins or for any uh, stored crop that um, may not be fit for human consumption. How else can they be used? Yeah, that's a great question. And there was another related question about the cost of testing in the field for things like mycotoxins. So really what we're trying to do is we're first taking a, a broad view of where are these issues uh, arising at harvest and post-harvest, so we have some risk mapping activities to identify where hot spots might be emerging. So then we can go in with on-the-ground testing, and, and there are options for that, and identify you know on a farm or at a village mill which bags that are coming in are contaminated. And then from there, there are a number of different options. Typically, what smallholder farmers do is they use the contaminated or discolored grains for feed um, or for, for traditional brew or other things. But you can still have a lot of health issues from that and a lot of exposure. So some of the things we're working on uh, with, uh, with our private sector partners and researchers are decontamination methods. So you can use gas like ammoniation, like they use in Senegal or uh, ozone decontamination, but also we're working with Matt Stashevich at University of Illinois on a low-cost kernel sorter, which uses uh, spectral sorting to, to sort out the contaminated kernels in a way that could potentially be uh, deployed at village mills. So there's a lot of alternative uses. If we can identify things that are contaminated, then we can see what options are best locally suited from there. Wonderful, thank you. As we have just reached the top of the hour, I think I'll go ahead and close the webinar. I want to thank our wonderful presenters for your deft answering of the questions and for the content you presented today. And most of all, I would like to thank our attendees for your um, wonderful uh, participation and for coming back to AgriLinks webinars repeatedly. We really appreciate uh, the way that you have helped us build this webinar series and engaged uh, with your community. And of course, thank you to the Feed the Future Knowledge, Data, Learning, and Training Project for uh, your wonderful management of the AgriLinks webinar series. So we'll go ahead and close up, and we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you all very much.